Please be seated. Welcome to B.H. Carroll Theological Institute's 2014 Convocation and Graduation Ceremony. We're glad that you're here with us this evening to celebrate this significant event in the life journey of each of our graduating students. We would like to recognize several groups of individuals who are present here with us this, this evening, and we're going to do it this way. If you belong to one of these groups, when I call the group out, if you would stand, and then if you would remain standing as we go through this process. If you are one of our governors, B.H. Carroll's governors, would you stand, please? If you are one of our distinguished fellows, would you please stand and remain standing if you would. If you are one of our resident fellows, would you please stand. Would you please stand if you are spouse or family member of a, a B.H. Carroll faculty or staff member, a spouse or family member of a B.H. Carroll faculty or staff member. If you are one of our B.H. Carroll alumni, one of our graduates, would you please stand? If you are a spouse of one of our graduates, would you please stand? Some of you are not sure if you're a spouse of a graduate. <laughs> you're confused. It's been a long three years. If you are a child of one of our graduates, would you please stand? If you are a parent of one of our graduates, would you please stand? If you are one of the assorted relatives of one of our graduates, <laughs> an in-law, an outlaw, would you please stand? If you are a church member or friend or general supporter of one of our graduates, would you please stand? The rest of you must be here just for the cake at, 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 uh, <laughs> after it's over. If you are not a part of one of those groups but have somehow played a role in the life of one of these graduates, would you also please stand? Okay, if you would, look around and see how much of a group effort, how much of a family effort it is to, to help folks through to the point of graduation. And give yourselves a hand, if you would, please. And you can go ahead and be seated at this time. We do also want to thank First Baptist Church Arlington for hosting us and for allowing us to have our ceremony here. We also would like to thank the singing men of North Central Texas under the direction of Don Blackley for being here with us and what a treat that is. One program note, Sam Carmack is ill tonight and so Dr. Larry Ashlock, director of our DMIN programs, will be leading the scripture reading as it's listed there in your program. Join with us now as we continue to celebrate and worship.
May we pray. Holy Father, we come in celebration of these graduates and for their hard work and sacrificial investment. Thank you, O oh God, for allowing us the honor of traveling with them through this journey and the great gift of bringing them to you. We have walked with them and their families, Lord Jesus, in their preparation. Now we will lean into their future with great anticipation of how you will use each of their lives to make an eternal difference in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Rejoice, the Lord is King, hymn number 197. Please stand as we worship together. Scripture reading is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant 
being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
Thank you, singing men of North Texas, that Jesus saved. I'm ready to preach. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I guess if you would summarize B.H. Carroll's message, it is Jesus saves. It is why we do what we do and who we are, and we are committed to continuing to equip men and women called to serve Christ and the diverse and global ministries of his church. And times like this is a time we can gather and see what God has done and hear what he is doing in the lives of our students and our faculty and what God is doing through and among the family of B.H. Carroll. This year is a very significant year for us. Uh, this marks our 10th anniversary of existence. Uh, it was in February of 2004 when the senior fellows and a very small staff moved into the offices right here at Mesquite and Abram, uh, the law offices there, and they began to paint and tear out walls and set up desks and, and began to, to serve the Lord in this mission that he's called them to. In November of 2004 is when B.H. Carroll began to offer its first uh, classes. And so we are very honored, I'm very honored to stand here tonight to mark that time in history. Uh, matter of fact, also in November of this year, November 11th to be particular, that um, uh, is we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the death of our namesake, B.H. Carroll. And during that uh, colloquy time, we've arranged our schedule around that, that we will go to First Baptist Church Waco, uh, see his grave there in Waco, and uh, hear about the future of theological education there in that, and invite the communities of Baylor and other uh, universities and seminaries in the area to celebrate what B.H. Carroll has done and what he set in motion by teaching men uh, in his office about the things of Christ and equipping them. And we have picked up that mantle of equipping the equippers, and that's what we do uh, together. So this is a significant year, and I have the privilege of uh, following Dr. Corley as president of B.H. Carroll, and I look forward to the second decade of what God is going to do. I believe with all my heart uh, that we will continue in growth and faculty and students uh, and in our global reach. Uh, God has already begun to, to reach, uh, take us to the ends of the earth uh, through the different programs. I've got a message today that uh, we just finished our fourth class, a set of classes in Vietnam uh, this, this year. And uh, those students, 84 of them registered there, continue uh, to receive the training that we offer them. Uh, our uh, enrollment, our individual head count to date is over 400. Who would have thought when we started that uh, we have uh, those registered in classes, uh, readers, uh, those, I'm sorry, that did not count our readers, uh, in, uh, in classes over 400. And after tonight, we will have 88 alumni uh, that uh, are scattered here and around the world to, to uh, serve the Lord through us. So God will continue to do that. But I want to look backward for a moment because uh, 10 years ago, uh, one of the pioneers of, of Carol uh, was a woman by the name of Fran Wilson. And uh, one of the things I, I appreciate what God does, uh, we heard recently this week, is uh, that a miracle can be defined as an aberration uh, to natural law. And uh, the philosopher Hume then said they are not possible. And Dr. Keener reminded us that by very nature, that is the definition of a miracle. It is an aberration of natural law, God breaking in and doing something unique and different. Well, I believe this first 10 years of Carol has been a miracle. Story after story and person after person have exemplified God's miraculous hand on us. And I believe one of his great gifts to us has been the miracle of exceptional people. And Fran Wilson is one of those pioneers and exceptional people. She is a servant of the Lord and a friend of B.H. Carroll. And tonight I have the privilege of presenting to her the President's Award. And I'd like you to come now, Fran, but I'm also going to invite her friend, come on, Fran, uh, and co-worker, Dr. Corley to describe more about Fran's service to B.H. Carroll and the Lord.
She wasn't worried until she thought I would say something. Fran uh, graduated from Monahans. Monahans is uh, far west of here, the land of a million barrel oil tank and endless sand hills. And Fran, as I've said to you before, it's a long ways from Monahans to this stage this evening. Uh, Fran graduated from Dallas Baptist University in uh, computer systems management. And her life took a turn in 1981 when she began in theological education. And uh, this past year, when she resigned, she completed 32 years of work in uh, training of people for ministry. Now, in a particular way, she spent the last 10 years as uh, mother superior to a group of prima donnas starting a new seminary. Uh, prima donnas are defined as insensitive and undisciplined persons. <laughs> and uh, she actually took on four of those kinds of people and managed our lives together for a long, long time. She wrote in her resignation letter that it has been my joy and honor to be a small part of this institute. In fact, she has been a big part of the institute. Fran, you'll recall that the last time I spoke to you uh, in the dean's office at Southwestern, I asked you about the starting of a new enterprise, and uh, you were interested, and it did not happen immediately. It happened in God's own time. But uh, in 2002, she had uh, retired, gone back to uh, doing whatever she wanted to do, and one of the best decisions that I have ever made is to ask her to come and literally run the school, which she did. Her faithful labor, energetic spirit, was magnificent with little resources, strange new procedures, countless setbacks, a besetting illness during this time. We could not have done this without you, Fran. And I trust that the tribute that we make this evening will be just a small evidence of the debt that we owe you. Fran uh, has a wonderful sense of humor. Long ago, she sent me a boss's day card. And of course, I had to send the obligatory administrative assistance card. And after uh, about 12 of those, 12 years, I wrote on one, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> the last boss's day card she sent me was very kind, as it usually was, but it had a poignant sentence in it. If you ever decide to start another school, don't come looking for me. I'm done. <laughs> and she deserves some rest. I'd made a deal with Fran. I said, you stay as long as I stay, and I stay as long as you stay, then we can leave together, which is what we did. Uh, when I prepared these uh, presentation words, I closed the file and thought about, where should I put this? I put it in a folder entitled, Blessing because you are. Over the past 10 years, Fran was most often seen publicly uh, standing over here by diplomas as we conferred them, and she handed them to me. And now I want to reverse the role and hand something to you. So if you would step back just a few steps, all right? Francis. Ann Wilson. <laughs> By 
by the unanimous consent of all your colleagues, the people associated with Carroll, students, faculty, many admirers, and my personal insistence, I confer upon you with all the thanksgiving and tribute and joy that comes with the President's Award. I congratulate you on the achievement it represents and pray God's richest blessings on you wherever you may serve. just like to express my appreciation to President Jean Wilkes for this President's Award. And if I may, I would like to say I'm, I'm very, very honored and yet very humbled. Never thought that I would be receiving this award. And if I may, I would also like to express my deepest, deepest gratitude to four people who are very, very dear to me. That, of course, is Bruce Corley, Jim Spivey, Bud Smith, and Stan Moore. These four men gave me the opportunity 10 years ago to join them in the pursuit of their dream. And they were extremely, extraordinarily committed to their calling and very courageous to take a, a leap of faith that they did to do something that many people said was not possible. But God knew it was possible. We've heard from the what Dr. Wilkes has had to say tonight, how God has led this institute over the last 10 years. And briefly, I would just like to say thank you to my B.H. Carroll whole family, how much I love all of you, and thank you, these committed and outstanding men and women have been able to work very hard together to shape B.H. Carroll into what it is today. And it's my dream that those who come after us, those who follow, will do so in the same commitment and faithfulness and dedication that these founders had. Thank you very, very much. Let's have prayer together. Lord, we thank you for Frances Ann Wilson, for her dedication, her spirit, the many days of uh, labor and the touching of lives, changing of people in ministry. Bless her and John Ed and their family, and give her great days ahead. We pray in Jesus' strong name. The official hymn of B.H. Carroll Theological Institute is found in your program. It's a hymn that reflects on our calling to be missionaries and teachers wherever we might serve. The tune was written specially for us by Dr. C.L. Bass, who's one of our distinguished fellows. Please join me as we sing together the Institute official hymn.
On the outskirts of Cairo, Egypt, there is a grave site. Obscure and seems to be out of place because it is the gravestone of a 25-year-old American male. The year of his death is 1913. As we read through the inscriptions on his gravesite, we come to one lone sentence that draws our curiosity to who he was and what he did. And that inscription simply read, apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Several year, decades ago, if you remember, Stephen Covey called on highly affected people to uh, take a look at their funeral and see who they would want to be there and envision what they would want those people to say to them and then to set about uh, pursuing those qualities in our lives. I don't know that this young man had this kind of epitaph in mind when he began to live his life. But when it came to the end of his life, there is no question that his relationship with Christ was the definition of who he was and what he did. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Graduates, tonight you will receive a degree that you have envisioned for some time. Some of you longer than others and what you intended to do. But you're here now. And we congratulate you on the hard work of this significant achievement. This degree will open doors that were not open to you before. And when people see the degree and know what you have done, uh, it will tell of your discipline and intelligence to others who may employ or engage you in ministry. But I'm here to remind you tonight that this degree does not define you. This degree is not your epitaph. It will not be the final statement of your obedience of God's call in your life. What will define you is your relationship with the one who has called you to serve him in the diverse and global ministries of his church. It is the depth of your relationship, not the height of your degree, that will determine what God has done in your life. One of my favorite New Testament characters is Paul the Apostle. We see him on the other side of his call. We read his letters and we watch his movement through Acts. But we forget that he too was very well educated, a powerful person of authority and status. We often play down his training in biblical interpretation, languages, diatribe, and religious politics. We look beyond his status as a Pharisee and as a Roman citizen that opened doors to halls of influence and power. We look past the fact that he was multilingual. His debate spill, uh, skills were par excellence and his, his passionate preaching we see in his letters and in his sermons. But through his eyes, we do not see him as a man of status and influence, but by his own confession, a man suffering, a man of suffering and service to the one who bought him and who commissioned him. It's interesting to me that, that Paul seemed to have everything in one hand that we all strive to seek uh, in the American culture, but he said no to those things. He resisted identification with those things that had defined him prior to the resurrected Lord's commission to take the gospel to all ethnic groups. And you remember in Philippians chapter 3, he obliterated his, his uh, resume. And he counted it all as scubala compared to knowing and identifying with Christ and his sufferings. You remember the passage? He said, I do not see myself as one who carried the sign of the covenant in his flesh from the race of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews according to the law, a Pharisee according to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and even according to righteousness outlined in the law, blameless. All of this in the ledger sheet of his life was in the lost column. And only one thing was in the prophet column. And that was to know and to identify his life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ alone defined 
who he was and what he did. In his pres- prison letters, uh, one of his, those is his friend, to his friends in Colossae, he gives us a picture of how he saw himself. Again, not forgetting the status he had, the power he had, the access to we- wealth and, and uh, authority that he had and used prior to his commission. And it took all of those things and applied them to God's call in his life. And he wrote to his friends in Colossae, he says, Now, I rejoice in this. Again, we hear this maybe too many times as biblical language, but let's hear it. As those who pride in our comfort, those of us who seek status, and those of us who long to have all the things our culture says we, we need. That's our natural side. And remember how he had those things, and now he is writing in such a way that had to be odd to the hear, the ears of those who knew him, and should sound odd to us tonight. But he says, I rejoice in the sufferings on your behalf, and completing what is lacking in the tribulation or sufferings of Christ in my flesh on behalf of his body, which is the church. He said, I myself have become a deacon, a, a, a servant, according to the stewardship of God, which was given to me for you, so that the word of God be fulfilled. It says this mystery, which has been hidden to ages and from generations, now has been made manifest or clear to his holy ones, the saints, to whom God has willed or wished to make known the riches of the glory of the mystery this mystery which is among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When we come to Paul and he is, he is talking about who he is and what his role is, he says, I am a simple house servant. According to the stewardship or the commission that God has given him, he lived, out, lived to carry out the commission his owner and leader had entrusted to him to complete. When we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talks about being entrusted with a commission. He saw his life purposed and filled, taking all the resources that he had, all the, the things at his fingertip, invest them in the commission that he had been trusted with. He was a simple table waiter in the household of God. And he identified himself that way. Again, we too often read Paul's words as biblical language, but he took a step down in status, power, and influence. He saw himself as a common laborer who worked for the one who redeemed him and set him free. When we uh, look further in the things uh, about his life, I wrote elsewhere that Paul never claimed leadership status for himself. Just the opposite was true. He made sure people knew that he accepted nothing for his efforts, and his highest calling was to be a slave of Christ Jesus. Read his introduction to Philippians and his opening to the Romans. He calls himself, I am a bond slave of Christ. Paul lived in a world where status equaled leadership, and he continually challenged that belief in his writings and example. Mark Strom Observed, while the Corinthians pushed Paul to assume the role and social presence of a leader, he pushed in the opposite direction, making servile labor the dominant image for every expression of talent and role. Paul downsized his leadership status when he left the ranks of the Pharisees to become a traveling tent maker. His religious peers surely could not have understood such a move and must have added to their frustration of his constant call to service and love Most leaders move up the ladder of success, not step off it like Paul. When we observe Paul's descent into greatness, we can agree, apart from Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Why is this so? Because the call of Christ on his life changed everything. What you have received through your hard work and following the program that has been laid out for you, you have received a new status. You have received also new tools to serve the God who has called you. But God is not calling us to a status and a rank 
that is above others, but he has called us to be a simple table waiter in the household of God. To be his servant, to carry out the commission that he has given to us. And to the world that will seem odd. And to others it would be strange, but it is the joy of our life to be able to say, we are the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to that epitaph on that grave that set our thought process and curiosity of who this man was. His name was William Borden. He was the heir to the Borden Dairy Estate, a multi-million dollar uh, business. When he graduated from high school, his parents gave him a trip around the world. I graduated and drove from Beaumont to Glorieta, New Mexico, but it's kind of the same. But it was while he was on his trip through Asia and Middle East and Europe, he sensed God's call on his life to give my life to prepare for the mission field. At age 16, while on this trip, in response to a friend who said he was throwing himself away as a missionary, a missionary is simply someone sent on mission for another. Paul saw himself as a servant of Christ, but he also saw himself as an apostolos, the, a sent one by Christ. You too are being sent. He says, I, you're throwing, his friend said, you're throwing yourself away as a missionary. And that day he went and he wrote in his Bible, no reserves. He went on to college to Yale and then seminary in Princeton. And it was during that time he gave away tens of thousands of dollars to missionary and uh, different causes. He also led his students, his colleagues, to, to prayer and Bible study and evangelism. Many of his, his peers said what a spiritual depth that he had beyond his age. When he graduated from, from Princeton, he began to receive offers of high-paying jobs, and that time he went to that same Bible and wrote two more words, and he said, no retreats. He then had finished, got everything together, and he was on his way. God had led him to speak to the Muslim people in China, and on the way to China, he stopped in Cairo to learn Arabic in order to communicate with those to whom he had been called to serve. And it was there that he contracted spinal meningitis, and within a month he was dead. But before he died, he wrote two more words to go along with these others. And those two words were, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Mary Taylor, in her introduction to his biography, wrote about his death. A wave of sorrow went around the world. Borden not only gave away his wealth, but himself in a way so joyous and natural that it seemed a privilege rather than a sacrifice. An heir to millions of dollars, holder of status and power, degrees and intellect. Some would say he squandered all of that on a call to serve and suffer for Christ. William Borden's descent into greatness in the eyes of God explains his epitaph. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. God has blessed you. You have honored those blessings with the efforts of these degrees. But God calls you to his service, and I offer to you tonight there is no greater place, status, position, rank than to be called a servant of Christ. And may our epitaph read, apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for, it, for what it represents to these who are graduating, to their families and their friends, to the churches that they serve and the ministries that they are part of to the faculty who walked along beside them, who mentored them, equipped them. That, Father, we see all of these things converge tonight. And our prayer is that they are pleasing to you and that they will give us one more step on the journey of submission and joy of being called your servants to, who have been entrusted with the commission to carry the gospel message that Jesus saves to the ends of the earth. 
And so, Father, I ask your blessings. I pray that great joy fill their hearts. And yes, Father, that uh, it will be your mission, not their ambition, that is blessed this evening. But, Father, that they will see your hand and they will know your joy in their life as they continue to pursue you and give their lives to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. and degrees. I recognize Dr. Adlin Cato, fellow and coordinator of Hispanic Theological Education, who will present the candidate for certificate. With the candidate for the certificate in advanced ministry training, please rise. Por favor, si el candidato para el certificado de capacitación avanzada para el ministerio, te pones de pie. Mr. President, the faculty is pleased to present one who has completed all requirements for the certificate in advanced ministry training. Señor Presidente, la facultad se complace en presentar a uno que ha completado todos los requisitos para el certificado de capacitación avanzada para el ministerio. Por la autoridad de la Junta de Gubernadores, la Recomendación de la Facultad, habiendo completado el curso de estudio prescrito por la presente confiero sobre ustedes el certificado de capacitación avanzado para el ministerio con todos los honores, privilegios y responsabilidades inherentes a los mismos, donde quiera que se van. By authority of the Board of Governors and on recommendation of the faculty, having completed the course of studies prescribed, I hereby confer upon you the certificate in advanced ministry training with all the honors, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto, wherever you may serve. Marco Silva. Les felicito por el logro uh, que este certificado representa. I congratulate you on the achievement this certificate represents. Mm -hmm. Amen. You may be seated. I now recognize Dr. Norma Hadeen, fellow and professor of Foundations of Education and director of the master's programs who will present the candidates for master's degrees. Will the candidates for the master's degrees please rise? Mr. President, the faculty is pleased to present two who have completed all requirements for the degree Master of Arts in Religion one who has completed all requirements for the degree Master of Arts in Worship, four who have completed all requirements for the degree Master of Arts in Counseling, and four who have completed all requirements for the degree Master of Divinity. By the authority of the Board of Governors and upon recommendation of the faculty, having completed the courses of study prescribed, I hereby confer upon you the respective Master's degrees with all the honors, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto, wherever you may serve. Matt Hollingsworth. Jason Huddleston. James Gregory Davis.
Felicia Mongo Barilope. Madeline Doherty Neiman. And Mr. President, Jessica Schneider Watson is graduating in absentia. Donald W. McCann II. John Douglas Hibbard. Adam Dwight Pardue. <laughs> Joshua Pinkston. Zachary Scott Wright. I congratulate you on the achievement these master's degrees represent. And now will you please join me in congratulating these graduates on their achievements. I now recognize Dr. Bud Smith, Senior Fellow and Professor of Foundations of Education and Chair of the Advanced Studies Council. Dr. Larry Ashlock, Fellow and Professor of Pastoral Leadership and Ethics and Director of the Doctor of Ministries Program. And Dr. Karen Bullock, Fellow and Professor of Christian Heritage and Director of the Doctor of Philosophy Program, who will represent, who will present the doctoral candidates. Will the candidate for the Doctor of Ministry degree please rise? Mr. President. The Advanced Studies Council and faculty are pleased to present one who has completed all requirements for the degree Doctor of Ministry. By authority of the Board of Governors and on recommendation of the faculty, having completed the course of study prescribed, I hereby confer upon you the degree Doctor of Ministry with all the honors, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto wherever you may serve. Lawrence Clayton Hopkins. <clears throat> Dr. Hopkins' project title was As You Go, equipping campus ministry leaders to understand and teach missional living. Dr. Hopkins' supervisor was Dr. Bill O'Brien. Dr. Hopkins is associate pastor at Lakeside Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. Candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, please rise. Mr. President, the Advanced Studies Council and the faculty are pleased to present four who have completed all the requirements leading to the degree Doctor of Philosophy. By authority of the Board of Governors and on recommendation of the faculty, having completed the course of study prescribed, I can hereby confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy with all the honors, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto wherever you may serve.
Hurley Clayton, Jr. Dr. Clayton's dissertation title, An Analysis of the Imago Dei in Black Theology and Ecclesial Praxis for the 21st Century. Dr. Clayton's supervisor was Dr. Robert Campbell. Dr. Clayton is the pastor of Berean Tabernacle Baptist Church in Liberty, Texas, and has retired after 17 years of ministry as chaplain of Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Shelley L. Melia. Dr. Melia's dissertation title, The Development of a Faith-Based Instrument to Measure Capacity for Resilience in Children. Dr. Melia's supervisor was Dr. Scott Floyd. Dr. Melia is assistant professor of childhood education, Dallas Baptist University. James N. Dungu. <laughs> Dr. Dungu's dissertation title, Recolonizing Theology, a critical analysis of the development of sub-Saharan African theology since the Ecumenical Association of the Third World Theologians in 1977. Dr. Dr. Dungu's supervisor is Dr. James Spivey. Dr. Dungu is with the Missions Church Planting Integrated Ministries in Dallas, Texas, and is also a professor of theology at Scott Christian University in Machakos, Kenya. Scott Edwin Schiffer. Dr. Schiffer's dissertation title, A Hermeneutical Analysis of the Sermon, Who is the Rich Man that Shall Be Saved by Clement of Alexandria? Dr. Schiffer was supervised by Dr. Robert Williams. Dr. Schiffer is Director of Distance Education at Criswell College in Dallas, Texas.
For the graduates, I congratulate you on the achievement which your doctoral degrees represent. Will you now please, again, uh, join me in congratulating the, the You may be seated.
Would you join me in prayer? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond measure, that he should give his only son to make each of us a wretch his treasure. Abba, Father, tonight we do not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. We boast alone in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. As we've heard tonight from Paul's word, we thank you so much that though for centuries and generations the mystery was not known, you have revealed it to us. And even as broken pots, you have mended us and filled us with the mystery of your revelation. And tonight we pray for us and those we send forth those that you have chosen, that they will make known among all the peoples the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ Jesus, in them and in us the hope of glory. And may we claim the promise that we're about to sing, that you go with us. Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and shall give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. We know, Abba, Father, that we're nothing without you. We're nothing without your Son, Jesus Christ. We're nothing without the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. But we know this, that we and those who go forth can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. May we remember that. No reserve, no retreat, no regret. In the name of the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.